Hi there, I'm Andrew Thomas, and today I'd like to talk to you about random check and Vitor strips complexes. That's me, by the way. Now, to the left, we have the famous iris data set, and I've gone ahead and plotted sepal length against sepal width. FYI, on an iris, this is what sepal length and sepal width are. On the right, we have the persistence diagram for the check complex of balls of radius r um, for this two-dimensional data set. This persistence diagram consists of the number of loops and connected components, or one and zero cycles. Let's say this data, or point cloud, was generated from some uniform probability distribution that would take any value with equal probability on the plot area to the left. Would we see a similar persistence diagram? We can extend this question to a general scenario, not just the iris data set. Assuming that our data comes from some probability distribution, how can we expect our persistence diagram to behave? What is the probability we'd see a persistent diagram like the one on the right? Well, that's a very good question and something people have begun to find really great answers to, but it's not terribly simple to describe. It's complicated, in other words. A simpler approach, and the first one that looked at probability, was concerned with Betty numbers of random check and Vitor Serps complexes, specifically average ones. This is what we look at here. So let's take a deeper dive and focus on the check complex formed from disks of radius r. In this slide, we see the persistence barcodes and the corresponding Betty number process at each value of the radius r. The Betty number process just counts the number of barcodes across a dashed line at radius r. For a small radius, or the dashed orange line here, we see a small Betty one. Very few one cycles are formed because there's not a lot of connectivity. For a large radius, the dashed red line, we see the same. There's too much connectivity and homology gets canceled out. When the radius is in between, or the dashed blue line, we get a lot of one cycles forming. We see a camel's hump, specifically a Bactrian camel, in the Betty number process. As the radius r transitions from zero, or near the dashed orange line, to infinity at the dashed red line, Betty 1 goes from zero to big, then back to zero. However, for this example, all the values of r are pretty small. Is there a clear way to understand the relative magnitudes of r that govern this phenomenon, or phase transition, in other words? And does this extend to the vitorius rips complex? Well, as it so happens, the behavior of this phenomenon depends on the value of nr squared. nr squared is roughly the average degree in the random geometric graph that underlies the check and vitorius rips complex. Note that n is the number of points in your data set, where n is 150 in the iris data set. r is the radius of disks around those points. To clarify, the vitoris rips complex is defined here as including a simplex when the diameter of the points is less than or equal to 2r. So, the behavior of Betty 1 depends on whether or not nr squared is relatively small, medium, or large. This corresponds to when uh, nr squared becomes zero, finite, and positive, or infinite in the limit. In other words, r is either much less than 1 over square root of n, about the same magnitude as 1 over square root of n, or much larger than 1 over square root of n. And you could have seen that on the previous plot here. With this being said, let's take a closer look at the case when nr squared is small. When nr squared is 1 over 15, you can see there's some very minor levels of connectivity happening, happening in both the check or the union of disks and the vitoris rips complex, which can be built from the black edges connecting um, the disks. But the first Betty numbers are zero. The check and vitoris rips complexes are too sparse for Betty 1. Aha, now there's some action. For nr squared is equal to 1, or approximately a finite constant, um, we see that lots of one cycles start to form. You can see one here, one here, and Betty 1 of both complexes are equal to 4. At this point, we're squarely in the hump of the camel, and things aren't too connected. But there's lots of edges and plenty of homology. We're seeing critical behavior of our random check in the Torres Rips complexes, which are just the right conditions for Betty 1. Finally, when nr squared is large, all the one cycles except for a single straggler in the lower left are canceled out. Soon the first homology will disappear. The complexes are too dense for Betty 1. 
that this phenomenon is not particular to the iris data set. In fact, I just picked this data set randomly and everything seemed to work out. This shows the benefits of a probabilistic approach. Additionally, this setup extends to D dimensions, and we can pose the following fundamental questions based off of our motivating example with the iris data set. In particular, if we have n random independent points, x1 to xn, with the same probability distribution on d-dimensional Euclidean space, the natural question to ask is how does the average kth Betty number behave, and how does it depend on nr to the d? We pose this question for both the Czech and Batoris Rips complex. Note that E stands for expectation, which is statistics talk for average, and just like in two dimensions, nr to the d is roughly the average degree of the random geometric graph underlying the Czech and Batoris Rips complexes. Now let's dive into some results. In his 2011 paper, Matt Kale showed that when k is greater than or equal to 1 and nr to the d is uh, not too big, the average kth Betty number of the Czech complex is approximately some constant times n times nr to the d to the k plus 1 um, for large n. Similarly, the expected kth Betty number of the torus rips complex is some constant times n times nr to the d to the 2k plus 1. To get an understanding of k plus 1 and 2k plus 1, we note that when k is equal to 1 and d is equal to 2, uh, k plus 2 is equal to 3 and represents the least number of points to form a 1 cycle in the check complex. That is, to form a 1 cycle in the check complex, you need at least 3 points or a triangle um, and can't form a one cycle with just an edge. Similarly, 2k plus 2 is equal to 4 and represents the least number of points to form a one cycle in the Vitoris Rips complex as all triangles become filled in. Now, when nr to the d is very big, so that nr to the d over log n is very big too, then for k is greater than or equal to 1, the expected kth Betty number in the check and Rips complexes is approximately 0 um, for large n. We can now quantify that the iris data behaves like it's a random check complex. For example, when k is equal to 1 and d is equal to 2, n times nr to the d to the k plus 1 is equal to 2 thirds when nr squared is equal to 1 15th. This is in the sparse case. If x1 to xn are uniformly distributed on a set with area A, um, recall that we were interested in the behavior of the persistent diagram for such a uniform distribution, then C1, the constant from the previous slide, is approximately equal to 0.64 over A squared, for Betty 1, that is. Supposing that A is equal to 10 for the iris data, then the average Betty 1 of the check complex is approximately 0 0.0043, which is very close to the true value of 0. Additionally, when nr squared is equal to 1, so we exhibit critical behavior, we can use the C1 on this slide as a lower bound. The expected Betty 1 is lower bounded by 0.96 in this case, which is basically of the same magnitude as 4, which is the true value in both the check and the rips complexes. Now, when nr squared is equal to 15, so that the check and the torus rips complexes are dense, then nr squared over log n is equal to 3, and isn't quite big enough for the homology of the check and the torus rips complexes to disappear. However, when nr squared over log n is equal to 7.5, in the actual data, we see Betty 1 equal to 0, as we would expect. So I've just given a very rough glimpse into the limiting probabilistic behavior of random check and Vitoris strips complexes and how real-world topological data can be modeled with randomness. We also saw how the behavior of Betty numbers um, constrained how our persistence diagram and barcodes looked. If you're interested in going further with these problems, the first place I would invite you to explore would be the 2011 paper of Matt Matthew Kale, which established the results I've listed above for the first time. A great survey paper, a little bit more updated, um, is a 2018 one by Omer Bobrowski and Matthew Kale. A more recent paper with more probability flavor and deals with the Betty number process we saw earlier is the one by Takashi Iwata and me. With that being said, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the random behavior of uh, Czech and Vitoria Strips complexes and why they're interesting. There are a lot more questions out there to be answered. And the results I showed you today are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the many questions still unanswered about the typical and expected behavior of persistence diagrams and barcodes. Thank you for your attention and thank you to AATRN and WinCompTOM for hosting this tutorial with